Well, good evening, friends. It's good to be gathered together at the close of the day to worship and to magnify uh, the name of our God. Uh, just to remind the younger folk that there is a, a joint uh, youth fellowship uh, with uh, the congregation in Kenneth Street uh, after the service this evening, and that will be in the AMA uh, McLeod Memorial Hall for uh, all the younger ones this evening. Uh, the rest of the intimations are pretty much uh, self-explanatory, so I won't go over them uh, again. Uh, please hear our call to worship to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, and to all who sin and need a saviour. This church opens wide her doors in the name of Jesus, the friend of sinners. Let's magnify his name together as we sing the words of Psalm 40. Psalm 40, singing verses 1 uh, down to 5. I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice and cry to hear. He took me from a fearful pit and from the miry clay, and on a rock he set my feet, establishing my way. Psalm 40, singing verses 1 down to verse 5. If you're able to stand for this singing, please do so, and we'll remain standing afterward as we call on the Lord in prayer. I Yeah. 
Lord in heaven, as we come into your presence this evening, we thank you and we bless you for carrying us through another day. And as we come to the close of the day, we thank you for an opportunity to reflect on your faithfulness to us in it, that perhaps some of us have had a very enjoyable and restful day, and perhaps some of us have had a more painful and perplexing day. And yet, in the midst of it all, you are the one who has been faithful in every step of the way. And we praise and bless you for this. We praise and bless you for the opportunity to begin another service of worship by singing your praises. And singing your praises that you have inspired and given in your own living and life-giving word. We thank you for the book of Psalms this great window onto the soul of the believer, and not only a window onto the soul of the believer, but also a window onto the very heart of God. We praise and we bless you for the words that we have been able to sing, words that remind us of the fact that you are the one who takes his people from fearful pits and from mighty clay, and you are the one who sets their feet on the solid rock of his own salvation, establishing their way, that you are the one who gives his people a song to sing, a song of praise to their God. And no matter what they might be feeling, no matter what they might be experiencing, they can still sing about your many wonders because salvation from start to finish is all a wonderful work of God. It is all of grace. We are so often reminded from your gospel that the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is the sin that we need to be saved from. And we thank you and bless you that this evening we can rest on and rejoice afresh, not only on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but on his very person, that you are the one who doesn't simply call us to embrace a set of doctrines and formulas, but you are the one who in the pages of the gospel says, come to me. And we pray that each and every one of us would know the joy this evening of coming into your presence, coming to you with wearied and heavily laden hearts, and that we would know the rest that only you can provide and that only you can supply. Bless us, O Lord, in this hour and this act of worship. We acknowledge that this is a privilege. And we think back to this time two years ago, how it was taken from us. We marvel afresh that we are able to be here as a congregation, singing your praises, reading your word, calling on your name, and even speaking to one another, joking and laughing with one another, Uh, loving one another as we have first been loved in Christ. Uh, So bless us, we pray. May we know your presence here among us. And when we leave this building later this evening, may we be able to say that it was good for us uh, to be here. Into your hands we commit ourselves in this service as we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. It is good to uh, see the younger ones uh, here this evening, and uh, tonight I brought uh, this uh, book with me. It's called In the Shadow of the Rock, Um, and it's a book that uh, Jeff Thomas, uh, who preached with us a few years ago, has uh, just written, and it's uh, it's his life story, and and he emails me uh, every week, and he's been telling me for the last year and a half that he's been working on this uh, book, this life story. And I've been hardly able to contain myself uh, at the thought of being able to read it. And then when I got it this week, I saw it was something like 300 and something pages. And I thought, I didn't realize it would be that long. But uh, he's a a lovely man. He's one of the most encouraging people uh, that that I've ever met. So he's a a very kind friend in that way. But also, uh, he's one of my favorite preachers. And and I love reading books about preachers. Maybe some of you might think that's a bit sad in some ways. But... But I just love reading books about different preachers. And so I'm going to be spending the next few weeks uh, reading 
uh, Jeff's uh, autobiography, uh, reading about him, finding out more uh, about him. Uh, I'll be reading the book very carefully. And if any of you notice a change in me for the better, maybe it will come uh, from, reading, <laughs> from reading the book. But if I start preaching with a Welsh accent, uh, you, maybe you can say stop reading that book because that's where he comes from. But as I was thinking about that book about Jeff Thomas that he's written about himself, uh, I was thinking more and more about the Bible. The Bible is a book uh, that God has given us, and it's a book that God has written about himself. Some people think the Bible's a book of rules. Some people think that the Bible's a book of commands. And there are rules and there are commands in the Bible. But most of all, the Bible is God's story about himself. He's speaking to us about who he is, and what he's done and what he's doing and what he's promised to do for his people. And because uh, every Christian is in a relationship with God, every Christian knows Jesus as their friend, they want to read this book to know more about him, to learn more about him so that they might live more for him. So I want to encourage you younger ones this evening to ask yourselves the question, am I reading this book, am I reading the Bible carefully? Not because my parents are wanting me to read it, not because I think I'll go to heaven if I read it, because this is the book that God has given us about himself and he wants us to read it very carefully and we're going to be looking this evening at a time when the people of Israel read that book together and they read it together for at least six hours they did nothing else they just read that book together for six hours well we're not going to do that tonight in case any of you are panicking and some of you might be panicking at the thought but uh, we're going to just read uh, this word and we'll be together for a short while as we do so. So if you turn with me to Ezra chapter 8. Those of you who have been following our Ezra series will know that we looked at chapter 6 last week. And you might have been expecting chapter 7 this week. Well, if you want a sermon on the names given in Nehemiah chapter 7, then uh, you can look for another preacher to do so. But uh, I thought I would give you a wee break from the, all that list of names, but we're going to be reading Nehemiah chapter 8 as Ezra brings God's word to the people. Nehemiah chapter 8 from verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning till midday, in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hasham, Hashabdana, Zechariah, and Mushalam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabathi, Hodiah, Masiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanam, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book from the law of God clearly, and they gave the meaning so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. But all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And then he said to them, Go on your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went on their way to eat and drink 
and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Amen. This is the word of God to us this evening. We'll again sing to the Lord's praise this time in the words of the hymn, Jesus paid it all. And again, if you're able to stand for this singing, please do so. Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say, I strength in the deep is small. I'll wait as watch and pray, find in me my only call. Jesus, pay it all, all to them I owe. as we prepare our minds and our hearts to uh, receive the word of God together. Donnie Duncan will lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God and our loving Father in heaven, how thankful we are tonight that Jesus paid it all and know that we owe nothing because we couldn't pay any of it ourselves. We were in our poverty and our need and Jesus saw us in our need and he drew us to himself. Lord, who is a God like unto thee, who pardoneth iniquity, passes by the transgression of a remnant of his heritage? He doesn't hold his anger forever, but he delights in mercy. No wonder the hymn writer could say, O worship the King, all glorious above. O gratefully sing his power and his love. O shield or defender, the ancient of days, pavilion and in splendor and girded with praise. Lord, we praise thee and we pray tonight that none of us here are gathered here tonight just out of habit or formality, but Lord, we would come with a sense that the psalmist had so long ago when he said, I joyed when to the house of God. Go up, they said to me, that he came with a sense of joy and he came to worship and he came to praise thee. 
because, as he said in another place, I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. I, while I live, will call on him who bowed to me as here. Oh, we praise you tonight that you're the God who is the hearer and the answer of prayer. Lord, remember each one of us here tonight. We come from different homes, different backgrounds, with different worries, different concerns on our mind. And Lord, perhaps we won't even tell those nearest and dearest to us, but Lord, you know each and every one of them. And Lord, you are able to meet each and every need. And Lord, we thank you tonight that the invitation of the gospel is still going out that Jesus is still crying out as he did so long ago. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And the waters that he gives us, Lord, we will never need to go to them again. He is able, he is sufficient, and Lord, he is willing to save. And we pray tonight that you would bless our brother as he proclaims the word to him, that he would have a sense of your presence, your upholding, your strength, your liberty, as he proclaims the word, and Lord, that, that that word would fall on good ground, that we would come into this place, Lord, with hearts that are prepared to receive the word, so that it will give forth an abundant harvest, even a hundredfold. So, Lord, be with us, encourage us, meet us at our need. Remember those, Lord, who aren't with us tonight for one reason or another. We pray that you would bless them where they are. Remember those who are downcast, those who are discouraged, those who are sad in their minds. Lord, we would pray that you would build them up and bind up those especially that are broken in their hearts for one reason or another. And Lord, we would pray that you would remember those in other countries who are persecuted for the sake of Jesus. And we pray especially for those in Ukraine Lord, words fail us when we, we pray for that place. We don't know what to say. But Lord, we are reminded of Jehoshaphat so long ago when he said, are you not the God of our fathers? Are you not the God over, over kingdoms and nations? And is in your hand not power so that no one is able to withstand you? Lord, you judge them, Lord, for their number is too great. We don't know what to do with them, Lord. But, Lord, our eyes are upon you. May the eyes of each and every one of your people be upon you tonight. And may they be calling upon you to intervene into that situation. Lord, to bring priests or to bring resolution one way or another. Because, Lord, the world is in a sad state. And, Lord, we, we are reminded of, of your own words in the days of, of Noah that he was sorry that he had made man. Oh, Lord, that you would intervene in this situation. And, Lord, that you would help. So remember us in mercy, Lord. Bless the world to our, to our good. May the Lord Jesus Christ be lifted up in all his glory tonight, and that many would be drawn to him, and that many would be truly saved, not just for time, but for eternity as well. And, Lord, that they would come and place their trust in him. Lord, we are a poor and needy people. We need your presence. We need your help. We need your encouragement. And we need your hand upon us for good. So be with us, we pray. Meet your every need and help us, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you, Johnny. Well, friends, would you turn with me, please, to the words that we read in Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. And reading again verses 1 and 2. Nehemiah 8, from verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. And so Ezra the scribe brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. It's always uh, interesting, I find, whenever I'm asked to preach in, in a different congregation uh, to see the different instructions that they give uh, regarding their services. In some congregations, I'm told uh, what to wear. 
and other congregations, I'm told what Bible version to use, and other congregations, I'm told what the order of service is going to be, and other congregations, I'm told how I should preach, and one congregation, I was even told what passage I was to preach on. It was the, the land allocation in Joshua chapters 13 and 14, and I had to humbly say to the elders, not a chance. I, I'll do that in the high free prayer meeting, but I won't do that kind of sermon uh, anywhere else. But on one occasion, I was told how long the whole service was to be. I had to have four singings, uh, two prayers, a reading, and a sermon. And it was all to come in at under 55 minutes. And the, I was told in no uncertain terms that if it was any longer than 55 minutes, the congregation would walk out. Well, I don't know how they would have coped in Nehemiah's day. Tonight we're continuing our studies in the book of Nehemiah and we're focusing on this public gathering to hear the word of God. And we're going to look at it under two headings, the reading of the word and then the response to the word. The reading of the word and then the response to the word. First, we've got the reading of the word, and you see that in verses 1 down to 8, where Nehemiah focuses on the public reading of the word of God. Nehemiah begins by noting the assembly in verses 1 and 2. He tells us that the people came with an appeal. Verse 1, they gather as one man in the square before the water gate. There is a, a coming together of the people with a common and united purpose. And having gathered, they approach Ezra the scribe. Now, this man had returned to Jerusalem about 14 years earlier. He is a man who is a priest and a scribe, described in the book of Ezra as someone who had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach its statutes and its rules to Israel. And the people approach Ezra and they present their appeal to him. They want him to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded to Israel. And after telling us about the appeal, Nehemiah tells us about the assembling of the people. Look again at verse 2. Ezra brings out the book of the law, brings out the word of God to the people on the first day of the seventh month. And he brings the word of God to a large assembly that is made up of men, that is made up of women, and that is made up of anyone, that is including children, who could understand what they were hearing. The whole community have assembled together, have gathered together to hear the public reading of the word of God. They saw assembling together to hear the word of God as being of vital importance. Something that they wouldn't choose to neglect or ignore because they felt like it. Because it was convenient for them. Because it was more comfortable to stay at home. They saw assembling to hear the word has been of vital importance. We move from the assembling of the people to the attitude of the people in verses 3 down to 6. Nehemiah tells us that the people heard the word patiently, beginning of verse 3. They gather in the square at the water gate, and with the congregation before him, Ezra proceeds to read from the book of the law of Moses, the word of God. Now that word read in verse 3 is an interesting word. It doesn't mean that he just mumbled the word. It doesn't mean that he just droned the word. This word means that Ezra shouted the word. He proclaimed the word. In fact, he even roared the word as he took it to them. And he reads from early morning till midday, about six hours. No 55-minute service for Ezra. He's there reading the word for six hours, and the people hear it patiently. Nehemiah goes on to tell us that the people heard the word attentively. Look again at verse 3. We read that the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Literally, the ears of the people were toward the book of the law. The picture that we're being given is that of people leaning forward to hear what has been said. They were attentive listeners. They were active listeners. They weren't checking their watches. They weren't drifting off to sleep. They weren't mulling over the latest football results. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't doing the dishes while the word was being read. They gave it their full attention. 
because they knew whose word it was, the word of God. Nehemiah goes further and tells us that the people heard the word respectfully. Look at verses 4 and 5. A wooden platform, a pulpit, has been set up especially for the occasion. And Ezra stands on it with Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right. And Pediah, Mishael, Malkajah, Husham, Hashabadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left. These are the leaders of the community. These are the elders of the community. And they're publicly displaying their desire to hear the word of God. They are setting an example. They are showing that gathering together to hear the word is important to them. And can I just say, that is what I love about the elders of the high three. It is what I love about our current elders, but it's also what I love about our past elders who I had the privilege of serving along with. They were and they are men who will be at the hearing of the word of God on Sundays and on Tuesdays and if they have garlic on Thursdays. They, they set an example. You know that yourselves, don't you? That our elders will be in the place where the word has been read. And that is what's going on here. And as the book is opened, and as the book is read, the people stand up. In, in some Southern Baptist churches, the congregation will stand while the word is being read, while the Bible is being read during their services. It's a posture and position of respect. You know, if the queen was to come into the room and speak to us, we would, we would stand. And when God is speaking through his word, people give it their respect. They stand. I'm not saying we're going to start standing. Maybe we'll end up standing for the whole services at this rate. But, but that is what the people do. They, they stand as the word is read. And that's what's going on. The people are standing from morning till midday. It's the word of God's read and they're hearing. And finally, Nehemiah tells us that the people heard the word worshipfully. Look at verse 6. As Ezra reads the word, he praises the great God, pray, blesses the great God, glorifies the great God whose word he is reading. And look at what the people do. They respond by saying, Amen. Amen. And they raise their hands. And at the same time, they, they bow their heads and they worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. I've been to some churches, maybe you've been to them, where the person leading the service will say something like, uh, we'll have a time of worship, meaning singing, and then we'll spend some time in the word of God. But according to Nehemiah chapter 8, the very reading of the word of God, the very hearing of the word of God ought to be an act of worship. It ought to be an act of worship. And having seen the attitude of the people, we then see the assistance that was given to the people in verses 7 and 8. Nehemiah draws their attention to the Levites and what they were doing. Verse 7, the, the Levites were the priestly family who had historically served as instructors when it came to the law, the word of God. We saw that in our studies in the book of Joshua. And here we have mention of Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabatha, Hodiah, Messiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah, the Levites. And they go among the people and they help the people to understand what has been read. And Nehemiah goes on to draw our attention to how they were doing this. Verse 8, we read, they would read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the meaning so that the people understood the reading. Now, that word clearly is important. It can mean to translate, but it can also mean to break down. The Levites are breaking down everything that has been read from the word of God into manageable sections, and they're giving it to the people in those manageable sections, and they're helping the people to understand it. The, the word has been explained to them. It has been exposited to them. It has been expounded to them by the Levites. The Levites are assisting in the hearing of the word. Well, friends, as we consider these verses, we're being reminded that the recovery, the renewal, the revitalization of God's people begins with God's word. I'll say that again. The renewal, the recovery, 
The revitalization of God's people begins with God's word. That is what we see in Nehemiah chapter 8. In Nehemiah chapters 1 to 6, Nehemiah has been addressing the condition of the walls of Jerusalem. But now in chapters 7 to 13, he is going to focus on the condition of the people of Jerusalem. And he knows that there are people who are in need of recovery. They're in need of renewal. They're in need of revitalization. And the key ingredient that is needed for their renewal, for their recovery, for their revitalization is the living word of the living God. And that is so important for us to take on board this evening. As we've said throughout this series, we are attempting to regroup and rebuild and reach out to our community with the gospel after two years of lockdown and restrictions. We want to see the Lord's gospel advancing. We want to see the Lord's kingdom expanding. We want to see the Lord's people flourishing and the vital ingredient that is needed for this work To take off is the word of God. Other things might be desirable, but the word is essential. When he was asked what contributed to the success of the Reformation, Martin Luther famously said, we are, I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. The the word did it all. More recently, Steve Lawson has written, we are not looking for gospel gimmicks in these days. We are not looking for trendy little techniques. We are looking for men and women and churches and seminaries and ministries and denominations who will stand up with the word of God, teach it, preach it, write it, sing it, counsel it, lift it up, let it out, let it fly. Let the word do the work. That's why it is such a concerning thing. When a a denomination or a congregation says we no longer need the word. The word does the work. Please hear me clearly, friends. If we want to see recovery, if we want to see renewal, if we want to see revitalization in our lives as individuals or as a congregation, then the living word of the living God must take precedence. It must have priority. Tonight, these verses are encouraging us to be a people of the book. A people who recognize and realize that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Moses recognized this. Ezra and Nehemiah recognized this. Jesus recognized this. The question is, do we recognize this? The priority on the word. But we move second to the response to the word. Look at verses 9 to 12. Here Nehemiah focuses on the people's response to the word of God. Nehemiah begins by noting that the people responded to the word with grief. Verse 9. We're introduced to three groups at the beginning of verse 9. We've got Nehemiah, the governor. We've got Ezra, the priest and the scribe. And we have the Levites, Joshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shebetha, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah. And they speak to the people. Look again at verse 9. They start by telling them that this particular day is holy to the Lord their God. It is sacred to the Lord their God. It is set apart to the Lord their God. And they tell them not to mourn on such a holy day, not to weep on such a holy day. And we're given the reason why they were saying this to the people. Look again at verse 9. Ezra has been reading the word to them. And the Levites have been going around explaining the word to them. And as the word has been read, and as the word has been explained, the people begin to weep. As they hear and as they understand the words that have been brought to them, the words that have been conveyed to them, they they feel convicted. As they are confronted with all the laws of God which they and their fathers had broken. And we can note Nehemiah's emphasis on the fact that all the people wept. Every man's weeping. Every woman's weeping. Every, Every child there is weeping. There wasn't a dry eye in the square at the water gate. It wasn't as if the people went home that day and said, did you see Spangy? He was a bit emotional in the service today. No, everyone was weeping. Everyone was grieving. 
And Nehemiah continues so by noting that the people didn't simply respond to the word with grief, but also with gladness. Look at verses 10 to 12. As Nehemiah speaks to the people, he presents them with a recommendation. Beginning of verse 10, he tells them to, to go their way, to go to their homes. And he tells them that upon returning to their homes, they're to do three things. They're to eat the fat food, that is the, the good pieces of meat. They're to drink sweet wine. And they're to share a portion of this with anyone who is lacking, anyone who doesn't have the fat foods and the sweet wines. Nehemiah doesn't want grief to be the last word as the word of God is read. Nehemiah wants joy, gladness, celebration to be the last word as the word of God is read. And Nehemiah gives the people the key reason why they should be glad, why they shouldn't grieve. Look at verse 10 again. He tells them that the joy of the Lord is their strength. The joy of the Lord is their stronghold. The word of God had been read to them and it had convicted them. It had highlighted all the ways that they had abandoned Lord's commands. It had highlighted all the ways that they had fallen short of the Lord's covenant. It had highlighted that these long years of exile in Babylon were fully deserved. It had highlighted that the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, that was fully deserved. But as the word of God had been read to them, it shouldn't have just convicted them. It should have comforted them. Because those laws had also said that the Lord would restore their fortunes. Those laws said that the Lord would have mercy on his people again. Those laws had said that the Lord would once again gather his people to himself and to one another. Those laws had highlighted that the Lord would do all this and that he would take pleasure. He would take delight. He would take joy in doing this. And now on this holy day, you've got the people standing in Jerusalem. They've been brought back from Babylon. Their temples been rebuilt. Their city walls have been restored. Derek Thomas writes, all around them are tokens of the Lord's love for them. All around them are tokens of the Lord's joy and delight in doing them good. And so Nehemiah is saying to the people, my dear friends, don't just stand there weeping. Don't just stand there mourning. Rejoice, be glad, because the joy of the Lord, the Lord's pleasure in doing you good over these last few years and indeed over these last few months as our city has been rebuilt, the Lord's joy is your strength. The Lord's joy is your stronghold. The Lord's joy is your security. And having heard Nehemiah's words, the Levites now leap into action to reassure the people. Look at verse 11. They calm the people and they go to the people saying, be quiet. For this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And once they've heard all the words of Nehemiah and all the words of Ezra and all the words of the Levites, the people respond in verse 12 with gladness. They, they do go their way. They do return to their homes. And as they go to their homes, they start to eat the choice meats and they drink the sweet wines and they give to everyone who has need. They are filled with great rejoicing, we read. Why are they filled with great rejoicing? Look at verse 12. They are filled with great rejoicing because they have understood the words that were declared to them. Now, friends, as we consider these verses, we're being reminded that the word of God convicts and it comforts. It produces grief and it produces gladness in its hearers. The word of God is a word that convicts. It produces grief. That's what we see in Nehemiah chapter 8. Here are a people who had previously neglected the word of God. They had previously rejected the word of God. In fact, if you go to the book of Jeremiah, as our friend here will be able to tell us, the book of Jeremiah speaks about times when they even burned the word of God. But on this occasion, they respond to the word of God with weeping. As they hear about how far short they have fallen, they are convicted by the word. And that, friends, is a very valuable lesson for ourselves. 
Steve Lawson writes, the word of God is a mirror that allows us to see ourselves for who we are. It enables us to see us as God sees us. It removes our self-deception. It allows us to see our sin and our need for grace. The word of God is a word that convicts. As I was thinking about this, I came across a story about the great evangelist George Whitfield, great evangelist of the 18th century, and he was preaching to a group of Scottish coal miners, and, and they, they were hard men. They weren't emotional men. And as Whitfield was preaching, he looked at their faces, and their faces were, were black with soot, and then he began to see that white lines were forming in their faces as streams of tears began to pour down. They were convicted by the word. The word of God is a word that convicts. Sometimes when a person is feeling convicted by the word, they'll shut their Bibles. There's nothing more disheartening than when you're preaching and someone just, especially if they're thinking the preacher's just going on a bit, time to just let him know we want to finish. Shut the word. But sometimes when the word of God is convicting a person, they don't just shut their Bibles. They, they shoot the preacher. They start saying things like, he's having a go at me. He's on my case. And sometimes when a person is feeling convicted by the word, they don't just shut their Bibles. They don't just shoot the preacher. They go as far as to move to another church in the hope that they will receive a more comfortable message. But my friend, if you are being convicted by the word in these days, if you are being pierced by the word in these days, I want to urge you to allow it to do its painful work. It's for your good. I've never had surgery in my life. I am scared. I'm scared of dentists, never mind doctors. But some of you have had surgery. And you know that it wasn't pleasant. But you had to undergo that painful operation for your good. And it's the same with the word. It needs to do that convicting, penetrating, piercing work. But the word of God is also a word that comforts. It produces gladness. That is what we see in Nehemiah chapter 8. Here are the people who had previously neglected and rejected the word of God. But on this occasion, they respond to the word with great rejoicing as they hear about the Lord's joy in doing them good. The, the word comforts them. And again, there's a very valuable lesson for ourselves. The word of God is a word that comforts, or at least it ought to comfort. The word of God tells us, listen to these verses, friends, please take them on board. The word of God tells us that the Lord delights in restoring the fortunes of his people and lavishing them with his mercy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. The word of God tells us that the Lord rejoices over his people like a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Isaiah chapter 62. The word of God tells us that the Lord rejoices in doing good to all his people. Now listen to this. With all of his heart and all of his soul. Jeremiah 32. The word of God tells us that the Lord rejoices over his people with gladness. And he exalts over them with loud shouts of joy. Zephaniah chapter 3. And the word of God tells us that the Lord endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. In his seven volume commentary on Hebrews, John Owen writes on this verse, the joy which was set before him was the glory of God in the salvation of the church, the accomplishment of all the counsels of divine wisdom and grace unto the eternal glory of God was set before him. So was the salvation of all the elect these were the two things that the mind of Christ valued above life, above honor, above reputation, above all that was dear to him. Put very simply, Jesus endured the cross for the joy of glorifying God and not simply the joy of glorifying God, but saving his 
people. Here are glorious truths, friends. Here are graceful truths. Here are gospel truths that the Lord has given in his word to comfort the convicted hearts of all his people. Here are glorious truths. Here are graceful truths. Here are gospel truths that the Lord's given in his word to gladden the grief-stricken heart of every Christian, every man who's in Christ, every woman who's in Christ, every child who is in Christ. Tonight, these verses are reminding us, friends, that the word of God convicts. Now, I see people coming out of church sometimes and they're in tears. They are convicted. But it also comforts. It points us to the God who is for his people and rejoices over them. The word of God is a word that produces grief, yes, but it also produces gladness. Let me close by asking, how, friend, are you responding to that word? Is it making an impact on you? Is it making an impression on you? Or do you this evening and maybe over these days need to ask the Lord to soften your heart, to open your heart to his convicting but comforting word. And I'm not just speaking to the unconverted tonight. Maybe if we were all honest, we would say we became hard over lockdown. I know I became hard over lockdown. Maybe you've become hard over lockdown. Do you need to ask the Lord to soften and open your heart to his convicting comforting words so that you leave times in his word moved by what you have read. Well, may the Lord bless these thoughts to us. We'll close by singing to his praise. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And if you're able to stand for this singing, uh, please do so. I don't know if we've sung this one before, but hopefully uh, you'll know it. Um, we certainly used to do it in school, so maybe some of you might also know it from school days. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We'll stand if you're able to sing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. And shall not live by faith alone, but by every word. That proceeds from the mouth of God. Alleluia, alleluia. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. And that service was 55 minutes. Well done. That's Brother your fault. Carrier. Let's pray. Oh, Lord in heaven, thank you so much for your word tonight. And we pray, O oh Lord, that it might make an impact and an impression on each and every one of us. So whether we came into this building knowing you and knowing your grace and love, or maybe we came into this building strangers to grace and to God, may your word find a soft place this evening in the hearts and minds of each and every one of us. You know that sometimes even when we may be going on with the Lord, when we may be going on in our pilgrimage, we can find ourselves becoming hard. 
that may your word continually convict us and comfort us. May it produce grief and gladness within us. And we pray that each and every one of us would leave this building glad that we were here, encouraged because we were here. So hear us and receive us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.